Hello friends, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shodangi. I teach English at Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Friends, we are into module 17. This module is written and prepared by Dr. Kalyani Dikshit, who teaches English in a college in Lucknow. Friends, in this module, we are to know about Edmund Spencer, who has been considered as the child of the Renaissance. Edmund Spencer is noted for Ed Spencerian stanzas and his enormous contribution through Fairy Queen and many other writings. In this particular module, we are going to relate to his the Edmund Spencer, the personality in the context of early Elizabethan period. We must not forget the fact that it was the early making of the English literature and the contribution of Edmund Spencer has to be evaluated in the context of early Elizabethan tradition, in the context of sonnet writing and the epic writing as we consider the fairy queen as one of the finest epics written in English language. Friends, here is a brief bio history of Edmund Spencer, the man. Edmund Spencer has been named after the age, the age of Edmund Spencer. So, you can easily understand the valuable presence of Edmund Spencer. Therefore, the age is known as the Spencerian age or the age of Edmund Spencer. Edmund Spencer was the son of John Spencer and Elizabeth Spencer. Spencer was born in the year 1552 in London. He received his degree of MA in the year 1576 from the University of Cambridge. He got married with Elizabeth Boyle in 1594. Amarathi is a sonnet sequence that celebrates Spencer's love for Elizabeth Boyle. The man of brilliance died on 16 January 1599. Friends, here are some works of Edmund Spencer on the screen. Number 1, Shepherd's Calendar and look at the year of publication 15. 79, the complaints, Daphnis, Astrophel, Amarathi and Epithalamian, Prothalamian, the Four Hymns and the Masterpiece, the Fairy Queen, 1590-1596. We have a separate module devoted to Fairy Queen coming up in the next. Spencer was greatly influenced by foreign writers like Ariosto, Tasso, Homer, Virgil, Plato, Cicero and Lucretius. Spencer's fairy queen was modeled on Ariosto's work Olendo Furioso, one of the prominent texts of all time. He was immensely fascinated by Ariosto's romantic epic. Friends, he follows the tradition of an epic poem and here are some elements. The fairy queen begins with invocation of the muse, an epic convention. He invokes Cleo, the goddess of poetry, Cupid, the son of love, Venus and Venus goddess of beauty. He makes use of epic similes or homeric similes to make the book read like an epic poem. He writes the tales of war, the heroic exploits, the chivalry, fears, battles, and with epical themes. 
the red cross knight has been referred to as the valiant elfi the elfin knight the epic phraseology the next epic convention is vast setting of the story the sto story is panoramic it spans different geographical locations the story is set in fairy land and the sir goes into hell with night to retrieve sans joy it's the long poem having as many as 12 cantos comparable with the vastness of the iliad and the odyssey 40 to 60 stanzas are found in each canto so you can easily understand the vastness and the scope of the poem another important aspect that we related with epic poem is medievalism in fairy queen the characters are drawn from the middle ages they are not ordinary people but the valiant knights and ladies magicians witches hydra headed monsters like foul error and the giants like orgiglo so you can easily understand they are not common people that we meet in everyday discourse medievalism is one of the key aspects of spencer that means digging out the middle ages atmosphere spencer's use of magic black art witchcraft represents medieval superstition he is also an important user of allegory it was the favorite device of the medieval times a long chain of noble knights ladies represent a vast picture of the middle ages so he honors the qualities that we associate with the middle English period or the middle ages. Friends, Edmund Spencer means allegory. Allegory makes abstract, comprehensible, affordable to read and to believe. So, the presentation of unbelievable through the believable lines is one of the master strokes of Spencer. There are four kinds of allegory that we come across in the work called the Fairy Queen. Number one, religious allegory. Number two, moral allegory. Number three, historical allegory. And number four, allegory of justice. If we talk about religious allegory, Reformation was the major religious movement of the Elizabethan age. In module 16, we have had discussions on different parameters of reformation. So, you can easily understand and correlate it. The reformed church of England is represented by the Red Cross Knight who raises his sword against corruption and evils of the age. So, this poem or the poems written by Edmund Spencer have sociological dimensions and commitments. Pope of Rome is represented by the foul dragon who arrested humanity in form of the parents of Una. This clearly indicates to the symbolic overtone that has been attached with it. Monster error swallows the papers and books that represent false teachings of Catholic Church. The very incident and its representation is contextually symbolic. Philip II of Spain is represented by Orgullo. 
and you understand the connotation exceptionally well. Now friends, if we associate moral allegory in the context of the fairy queen, we have the chart as you see it on the screen. Good characters represent virtues, bad characters represent vices of the time. Red Cross Knight, very important character in the text, the fairy queen represents holiness. Lady Una represents truth and innocence. Parents of Lady Una are the embodiments of humanity and dragon all stands for evil. Duessa, falsehood, archimago, hypocrisy, son's law, lawlessness, Corsisa, blind faith, Kirkipine, carnal passions, Lucifera represents pride, or Giglo, papal power, or pride, and Arthur, magnificence. After this come historical allegory. Historical allegory implies the representation of certain historical figures or historical events through the portrayal of characters and design of events in the series of plots or construction. Book 1 is a celebration of the part of Elizabethan Tudor, the Protestant Empress and you can easily understand and relate it with the historical time as portrayed in this book. Duessa and Una symbolize the story of impure papal religion and impure imperial religion. A snake like a beast allegorizes the inquisition which represented papal tyranny. The Earl of Leicester has been represented by Prince Arthur. Now friends, after historical allegory, here comes allegory of justice. Allegory of justice is present in two parts of book 5. In Canto 12 article, the symbol of justice finally dispenses the justice. The need of justice for love is represented by Britomart. There is a giant who represents egalitarianism, and egalitarian or egalitarianism pretends to be justice. Now, when we talk about Edmund Spencer, we talk about the pictorial qualities of Edmund Spencer. He is one of the finest word painters of all ages. His masterpiece, Fairy Queen, is rich with concrete details, figurative descriptions, epic similes and artistic innovations. But the master stroke lies with the word paintings. That means, he pictures through words. Just like a skilled painter, without a brush, with the help of a pen, he portrays the pictures dexterously through the words and the, pa and the paintings are visible through words. He draws persons scenes from nature, the human body, especially women's body, majestic palaces, grotesque, monstrous descriptions and sceneries. The color sense of Spencer is amazing, which astonishes both men and women alike. Friends, 
just look on the script on the screen you have paintings and pictorial descriptions nature painting in words and we contextualize in stanza 10 of book 1 canto 3 here he describes the beautiful place in book 1 canto 4 he paints a picture of majestic palace. Palace was built of square bricks, wells were covered with sheet of gold, it was decorated with delightful flowers and windows. A stately palace built by squared bricks, which cunningly was without mortal lead whose walls were high, but nothing strong nor thick, and golden fully all over the displayed, that pure sky with brightness they dismayed, high lifted up were many lofty towers, and goodly galleries far above laid, full of fairies, windows and delightful bowers, and on the top dial told the timely hours that is book 1 canto 4 line number 4 sorry stanza 4. Friends, when we talk about painting we should not forget about the coloring. The color strategy of Spencer is immaculate. His description of red white, black green, gold all colors is really apt appropriate and amazing. Taining of face with scorching sunny ray, depiction of white as more white than show snow, but the lady whiter than the ass, all are beautiful through descriptions. Milk white lamp, coal black blood rushing from monster's body, Depiction of Aurora, the purple god of dawn, all are in one words amazingly wonderful. Friends, in this module, we try to capture the importance of Edmund Spencer. We try to contextualize him in the context of Elizabethan early writers. And we associated the contributions of him through different linguistic, thematic, structural, stylistic, stand up the innovations and as a whole his contribution to the literary growth and development of English language and literature during his own time. He is so important in his time that the age has been named after him and we call it the age of Edmund Spencer or the Spencerian age. I hope you enjoyed this module very much. Thank you. Spencer was uh, an Elizabethan poet who came to County Cork um, in about 1580, and he spent much of his time here, both as a colonial administrator and as a writer. Um, his relationship with Cork has always been a difficult one, a complex one, both as a writer and obviously as a member of a political uh, structure. Uh, nevertheless, it's one that I'm very keen to explore. I feel it's a privilege, if a challenge, to teach and think about Spencer in Cork. Spencer wrote, amongst many other works, uh, uh, an epic poem entitled The Fairy Queen, and it is without doubt the most important non-dramatic work of English Renaissance literature. In The Fairy Queen, his epic poem written in two installments, 50, or published in two installments, 1590 and 1596, and then some published posthumously, um, he seems to be increasingly moving away from a conception of his cultural centre uh, in the English court, in the figure of Elizabeth. I think that that's in many ways where Spencer starts. 
And the longer he's in Ireland, uh, the more he engages with his Irish experience at an imaginative level. I think the experience is difficult for him, and yet nevertheless it's one in which he increasingly feels a dislocation um, in relation to his English origins, and if not quite a location in the Irish context, then a um, increasing attraction towards exploring its topography, its land, even, I would think, uh, to some extent, its, its languages, its bardic literature. That's certainly been argued in some of the recent um, scholarship. So The Fairy Queen is, a, is, is in, for me, what makes it interesting is it's an epic poem that fails. It fails to become a kind of propagandistic uh, voice for the English nation, and it becomes a poem of dislocation, some might say of exile, of, of colonial experience, but also perhaps of a writer who begins to find a new kind of home or a new um, sense of orientation in this world to which he has come. I like to think of this walk as something which is startling almost to students who know Cork well, who may have been brought up in the city. Cork isn't a city, although it is an ancient city, people have lived here for over a thousand years, it's not a city in which we're immediately presented with a sense of its antiquity. It's not like walking around somewhere like, like York or even Kilkenny. Um, and yet there's a kind of detective game that we like to uh, engage in on this walk, a form of archaeology, of unearthing a city uh, that is beneath our feet and then imagining it uh, using things like place names and uh, street names and street outlines. I like to think of this a little bit um, in, in a sort of medieval and renaissance mode as a palimpsest. And a palimpsest is um, in manuscript studies when we have a parchment manuscript, an animal hide manuscript, which has had at some point in the Middle Ages writing on it. And then also at an early part of its career, uh, a monk has scraped off that writing, uh, has erased it and used the parchment again. And often with the help of ultraviolet light, we can see the earlier writing underneath the later writing. That earlier writing is the palimpsest. And that's what I like to do as a city. We're reading it like an old book. Uh, we're using little signs that are still remaining in street names or little bits of the medieval city that are still there, but which people could very easily walk by without seeing, such as the little bit of the city wall in Bishop Lucy Park, or quite near that, um, a cannon at the end of Tucky Street on Grand Parade, which is put into the ground, which was a mooring post. We're reminded of the very um, port nature of the city, a walled city surrounded by waters on a flood plain, which would have probably looked like nothing so much as a kind of cruise liner floating above the plain, particularly in winter, particularly during times of floods. So when we set out on this walk, we use a number of old maps, like the 1610 John Speed map, and we begin to orientate ourselves with maps that initially look quite confusing, uh, but which in time become um, uh, excitingly familiar for the students, like learning older forms of the language. The great privilege is that we then go to Kilcolman Castle, just outside of Donorail. We're very, we're very fortunate to be able to do this because it's on private land and the, the landowner is very gracious in allowing us to, to go to the castle. A substantial part of it still survives. Uh, it's the only example of our being able to recapture the, the, the writing space of a major uh, English Renaissance writer. We can't do that for Ben Jonson. We can't do it for, for Shakespeare. There is a, a cottage which Milton spent a year in. But really, it's quite astonishing to come to this place because it's not only where he worked. It's not only where there must have been literally hundreds of, of books, of manuscript papers. Um, but it's also the landscape with which he has this this exploring, difficult, heuristic, uh, imaginative process. And uh, I think the students, as we come towards the end of the, of the year-long seminar, find they've really earned the experience of, of coming to this place and, and meditating upon it. The castle is a ruin because in 1598, in the, um, the Earl of Tyrone's Rebellion, it was sacked. Ben Jonson gives us an account, which is possibly reliable, but not <laughs> possibly not, uh, that Spencer fled the castle with his wife and family. A baby, according to Johnson, uh, was killed in the fire. Certainly, Spencer must have lost a great deal. Uh, he returns to London and he dies a year later, 1599. He's buried in Westminster Abbey next to Chaucer, and that's the beginning of 
uh, Poets' Corner. Nine or ten years after his death, uh, a fragment of what seems to be another book of the Fairy Queen is published, The Mutability Cantos. So clearly he was still at work on the poem. Uh, and this final bit, perhaps in many ways, is the perfect epitome of his writing career, of his engagement with Ireland. It takes place upon what he calls Arlo Hill, the Vale of Aherlow, which is, which is Galtimore. And it provides a, a moving, uh, and I think restful summation to the struggles that he had um, with his experience of living abroad, his ambitions as a writer, his difficult relationship with Elizabeth. This fragment, not intended, obviously, to be the ending of the poem, but it is the ending as we have it, uh, finally comes to a, a, an act of renunciation. In effect, a renunciation of the efforts of the poem itself. It finally just comes to, to rest in a, in a Christian vision of a time beyond time, a time when God calls it an end to creation. And that is the moment where the poet believes he will finally find the stability, the meaning which has, has eluded him throughout his life. It's eluded him uh, in figures like Elizabeth. It's eluded him ultimately in his, in his Irish life as well. The course is, de is developed out of a third year seminar I teach on Spencer. And as I said, when I came to Cork, there really wasn't, I mean, I probably was hired for that reason, I suppose. There wasn't uh, a lot being taught at that particular moment uh, in relation to Spencer. And although I realize that he um, is a difficult figure in the, in the Irish imagination, um, I felt for that reason, amongst others, uh, he should be explored, he should be taught, he should be debated. So it began with a third year seminar course, which has been developing over years. I also incorporate into this walking tour my MA students. Um, and we also obviously teach Spencer. It's not that I'm inundating students with Spencer, but I do feel that it is important that in the context of Cork, uh, we, we look at this, in some sense, regional or local writer. And I would hope in time that this might become something which would have a broader appeal uh, in the context of the city. I always tell students to bring a friend if they want. On some occasions that's happened. People have brought siblings. Um, I've spoken to people in the city about it who've become interested and occasionally have come along, people from outside the university altogether. And I'm hoping in time that might, that might increase.